So I'm here with Alan Graham, who many of you should know by now, but if you don't, then uh, you should know that he's the founder and, and uh, I guess CEO is the word we use. What title? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mobile Loves and Fishes and the Community First Village, where Abor has made a 10-year commitment to be in partnership with you. So thank you for joining us today. Yeah, awesome. Great to be here, Emily. Thank you. You bet. So Alan, we've had um, several conversations about what community means to you, and especially in the sense that you have literally built a community from the ground up in a way that's unique and special. Um, and I think everything that we've all known about community and neighbors has changed at a time that we've been stuck literally in our own homes for so long. So I want to know, how are you thinking about that? What do you feel now? Well, our fundamental foundation is really built on you know, eight characteristics associated with what we call home that form a community. And I'm not going to go into the details of each. I'm just going to kind of rattle the eight off. But uh, we believe that home is a place of permanence. You, you and I are really not meant to be so mobile, or not mobile individually, uh, but mobile in a, in a pack. Um, home is a, pl is a dwelling place. You know, it's literally that place when you and I cross over the threshold, we liquefy and kind of uh, consume every nook and cranny of our home. Home is a place of embodied inhabitation. Uh, in my office, you see things hanging up on the wall that represent who I am. It's the same thing in uh, our home. Uh, one of my favorite things is the, the little scale that we used to measure the kids as they were growing up. And now when we all get together, they measure dear old dad because he shrunk a little. And so that's part of the embodiment of who we are as the grand family. Home is a place of hospitality. You know, when I came to the Abor, the building there on Spicewood, uh, you know, to do that piece with you recently, uh, that whole place felt welcoming and just exuded hospitality, which I think is uh, typical of who the realtor community is. Home is a place of stories and memories, and it's often said that the mortar that holds the bricks of even the most impoverished home together are the stories and memories that flow. Uh, from that home. Home is a place of safety and refuge. Uh, Trisha and I owned a home and raised our entire family in Westlake Hills, 34 years. We sold that home two years ago. Do you know that nobody ever had a key to our house? It was never locked. Uh, we uh, dedicated that place as a place of safety and refuge. And then uh, home is a place of orientation. And no matter where I've been in the world, and I've been in some pretty great places, my compass is always oriented to Austin, Texas, my home here in Austin, Texas. And then last and not least, home is a place of affiliation and belonging. It does turn out that we like to be around people kind of like us, uh, people that have shared values, shared uh, living experiences, all, all of those kinds of uh, things. And the embodiment of those eight characteristics is really, to us, what forms community, a place of belonging. And, um, and COVID, no COVID, that has not changed uh, for us. Now, there's some nuances to what's going on here uh, that are challenging, but uh, uh, we're still laser focused on uh, building what we believe is uh, a community. So, so you've talked, you, you speak to the nuance a little. Tell me the pivots that you've had to make. I think every one of us has experienced that from a business perspective. Obviously, as parents, we've pivoted to become part-time teachers and supporters of our children's education. What pivots are you making in the village? Well, um, you know, we were accustomed to having 285 volunteers every single week out here on the property. And we had to essentially close uh, the property to outsiders, not knowing uh, where you had been, what airplane that you had been on, what uh, high risk airport did you go through, or, uh, you know, what bar were you hanging out in uh, the night before. Um, you know, our movie theater, which we normally have free movies every uh, every Friday night, that's, uh, that's been shut down. Our bed and breakfast uh, has been shut down. Um, and we've basically closed the gates and we have our neighbor guards out at the gates to ensure that uh, uh, nobody gets in that 
you know, le legitimately shouldn't uh, be here. Um, and so that's been uh, somewhat of a challenge for a community that is so open and outward uh, facing. And um, I'm sure it's not unlike what uh, the realtor community is experiencing uh, right now. Uh, you know, we realtors are people that like to gather and hang out and be with each other. And yes, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's true. It I um my sweet leadership is like, when can we see each other again? And yeah. they're not wrong. I, I want to see them as much as they want to see us. But I think we all want to be safe too. So it's it makes well, sense. And, and, and additionally, our population, uh, I mean, a bulk of our population that uh, live here uh, are very vulnerable. 65% uh, uh, of our neighbors have two or more uh, comorbid diseases. Uh, and so we have to be uh, e extremely careful and protective of our, of our friends. And uh, uh, praise God, we haven't had one case uh, in the village. So That's amazing. Yeah, yeah truly. How... Do you feel like their your neighbors' experiences before this prepared them in a different way to navigate something just so extreme? Uh, profoundly and beyond anything that you can imagine. Uh, yeah. I, I will tell you uh, the least thing on their concern plate is that virus. Yeah. Uh, these are men and women uh, who I consider the most resilient and resourceful people I've ever met in the world. Uh, they have experienced trauma beyond anything that you and I could ever uh, imagine. Uh, and the idea of this pesky little virus to them is like, eh, you know, and um, they're not worrying about it, although they're extraordinarily compliant with all the social distancing and the mask uh, uh, stuff. And we have a lot of fun uh, with it. Uh, but the shutdown has also created the same level of anxiety that it has in all of us. We're ready to get out. We're ready to be moving around. We're ready to be with our friends. Uh, um, and so they, they feel the same way. But they're not worried uh, typically in the same way that uh, the rest of the world seems to be worried about that, uh, about that virus. Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't call the village a, a dense place necessarily, but there is, you know, you've got every kind of housing type and a lot of diversity in that, which is really what makes it special in some ways. Um, but in some cases, you're, you've got shared facilities that are anchoring the home, the full home experience of some of the residents. Has it been a challenge to manage the social distancing guidelines in the context of that? No, um, again, uh, everybody's been uh, super duper compliant. Uh, we obviously yeah. have a store, and so we've limited the number of people inside the community market at any given time. Uh, we instituted a daily uh, a meal uh, here uh, every day in order to keep people as much off the bus and out of the grocery stores as we could. And uh, they just all, and you know, there's hand washing stations and you know, you can walk around and somebody will have the, you know, I love the mask deal. It'll be. Yeah. Yes, sir. It is the accessory for 2020. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> yeah. But most people aren't doing but it right. Down here on their chin. Yeah. 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 Or right up under the nose. You're going to be good to go. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so we'll look at each other and they'll pull it up and, uh, you know, they're doing the best that they can. And, uh, and, and again, it, it seems to work and, you know, and, Nobody has a shared wall here, so we're not confined inside like right. an apartment building where we're sharing uh, uh, air conditioning space, uh, vents, and all that. And so I think that's gone a long way to help us. We, we can really isolate in place and social distance here in an extraordinary way. And, you know, and as the studies are showing, uh, you know, people that are, you know, outside uh, have a far less uh, opportunity. It's those of us really that are in confined uh, spaces that are that are having the larger problems. So this may have yeah. been built perfectly for a pandemic. Yeah, no, I mean, it, you do think about um, the, the importance of permanent supportive housing in the context of that not just being a whole bunch of people that were crammed in a space for a temporary solution, which would have been a, a nightmare in this yeah. environment. Um, and it really does speak to the, the way that you've thought about how to house people. And it, it is pandemic proof, which is good on you because not all of us were. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, you know, I think I want to turn the conversation a little bit. There's obviously um, a new narrative in our communities at large, and it's it's one that um, is unrelated to viruses and, and pandemics, but is really just um, attacking our communities in the same ways, in some sense, in that um, in that systemic racism is something that is a part of our lives in all different ways. And I think many of us are starting to understand that more than we used to. What, how does that conversation sound at the village? What, what are, what, how do your neighbors feel about what they're seeing and hearing? And, and how involved are they in that conversation? Well, when you look at, uh, you know, if you take the black population of Austin, it's around six or 7% somewhere uh, in, in that neighborhood. But on the streets of Austin, it's about 40% African American. And, um, and so our demographics uh, here at the village uh, come close to mirroring what the demographics are uh, on the on the streets. Uh, and you know, uh, you know, I have no way of really articulating this other than being from a, a white guy that did not uh, grow up in the same fashion that my uh, African American friends have uh, have grown up. So there's no possible way, actually, for me to relate uh, to that experience. And I'm attempting to do all the things that everybody else is doing, read as much as I can, stay the freaking way away from the social media stuff, but really dive into the real stuff, listen to real people, uh, uh, watch real documentaries. Uh, you know, several weeks ago before this thing ever hit, uh, Just Mercy, uh, and that's a phenomenal deal. And then yeah. this past weekend, Trisha and I watched uh, 13th, about the 13th Amendment, and that was mm -hmm. a compelling uh, piece. But I go back to our fundamental philosophy, and I carry in my pocket everywhere a series of these here, which is our vision, mission, values, and goals. I want to read to you our number one goal, uh, and then I want to read to you our uh, some of our core values. Our number one goal. These are corporate etched in granite goals. Transform the way people view the stereotypes of those who find themselves homeless. So the first thing for us is uh, uh, to rebrand who these men and women are. Mm -hmm. And in that rebranding, in that paradigm shift of transforming those stereotypes, that includes African-Americans, that includes uh, Latinos, that includes people of, you know, gender and gender identity, uh, gay, lesbian, uh, transgendered. That includes people who are Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Zoroastrian, Buddhist, Hindu, uh, uh, you name it. Um, and that population that lives on the streets, that multi-diverse population now lives in this village. And, um, and I live here in the middle of that village uh, with them. And I, I've, I've had the wonderful blessing of being able to hear stories from their lives uh, that are nothing but unbelievable. Um, and on, in the village here, we have an organization called Life Anew, which is, uh, they're all about restorative justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and their presence here for the past year and a half has been nothing short of uh, powerful. And, uh, and having that organization here, uh, and I came up with a line that if you want to restore together, you got to live together. So it's very difficult, Emily, for all of us to live in our bubbles. And I love Westlake. No condemnation about Westlake whatsoever. It's one of the greatest communities on the planet with all the issues that many communities have. But it was a bubble. And there are multiple bubbles all around town. Until we get out of those bubbles and begin to uh, live together, to restore together. If we want to do justice together, we have to live together. If we want to... Uh, uh, restore uh, together, we must love together. If we want to restore together, we must suffer uh, together. And, um, and I think we just have to move into a different way of thinking uh, about that. 
And then our core values real quickly, I'm not going to read them all, but God infinitely perfect and blessed in himself and a plan of sheer goodness freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. Now, he didn't say white man, black man, Christian man, Jewish man, female man, you know, man, man. Uh, it's just all of us. And then by virtue of being created by God in his image, we are all called to live in community in, and relationship with him through each other. So it's not through the white each other. Or the, it's all of us in this beautiful melting pot that we call the United States of America. The family is the original cell of social life. And so that's what we're trying to emulate here at Mobile Loaves and Fishes. This is 22 years of emulation, by the way. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself, uh, pretty fundamental uh, as, a, as a Christian. And all members of the human family are equal in dignity. Th this is what drives and always has driven uh, Mobile Loaves and Fishes. And if I think people, if they want to witness um, the movement towards justice as almost best as we can, it seems to be happening out here at, at the community first village. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. uh, and, I, and I'm not saying that this is like the shining light on the hill. We got plenty of issues out here. I had a great one last night, uh, you know, with a, with a couple of people that were, you know, at each other a little bit verbally. Uh, but um, it's a beautiful place of learning, healing, forgiveness, reconciliation, and understanding. So yeah, but but I think I think if I take away from what I hear you saying, it's not unlike what what many people are saying right now, which is that if you can reframe your experiences to be those that are shared with others, so that it's not just what happens in your world, in your lane, and in your four walls um, to have a better understanding of what other people are walking, then you're probably likely to transform the way that you think and feel. Well, we'll be, um, yeah, we'll become better, I think. Uh, and, and I'm not sure what transformation really means, you know? I mean, if yeah. I think yeah. about- That's you, another chat with the experts. We'll have to do that next. Well, time. I'm not even sure there's any experts <laughs> on complete yeah. transformation, but I mean, just look at your life with your husband who I know you love. Uh, Most days. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And it's, it's a complex deal. So um, we're complex beings with complex needs and, uh, and, and trying the best that we can to understand each other's needs. is going to draw us closer to that uh, nirvana of transformation, if that even uh, yeah. actually exists. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, what we can do is to try and what we can do is yeah. to continue to push ourselves to ha to be in community with people that we might not have been in community with before. Yeah. Uh, so what can we do as realtors, as people in Austin that just want to help the village and how, how do you need help differently now maybe than you did before? Well, I don't know that it, we need help any differently. I mean, this COVID thing is going to end up behind us. I don't know exactly when. Uh, obviously, yeah. I mean, we're having conversations about reopening the village and what that looks like. And uh, I would bet most of uh, your constituency are already testing the waters and getting together and, you know, wow. hitting a few restaurants. And, and so, um, and as we come to understand uh, this pandemic, and it's real implications when we get real data that none of us have um, about what are our risks. Um, at some point in time, we're going to get to a point where uh, we're going to be back to some level of normalcy, if not full normalcy. I, I completely believe that. This is not our first pandemic, uh, by the way. There have been far more violent uh, and destructive pandemics in our, uh, our, our history. But boy, we, we sure knew about this one. And so, look, it's, it's all about our, our sadness is our volunteers coming out. We've had to, uh, you know, I mean, I think we had a, you know, a work day or a serve day coming up with you guys that we had to yeah. uh, postpone. And these are disappointments for us because we want people to come out here and, and hang with us. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll be, we'll be there as soon as your doors are open. We're ready yeah. to be there and committed yeah. to the partnership. And uh, just want to continue to support you and the good work that you're doing. Thank you for all that you do. Yeah, thank you, Emily. I appreciate it very much.